morning. You know, that, that last shot, not the cigar-smoking Jew at Paramount Pictures. Actually, let me adjust my volume here a little bit. Test, 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 test. Eh, whatever, this works. This will be fine. Uh, the One of the last shots there was that guy getting into his car. And I noticed this a lot in 50s films. I don't know if this just made it more convenient to shoot this way. It took less screen time or whatever, having someone walk to their car. and uh, But he gets in on the passenger side and then slides over to the driver's side. Now, that's easier to do in a, in a uh, convertible with, like, a bench seat, you know? And, you know, I guess you don't have bench seats anymore. But I've seen this in other movies. Like, in, I was watching Psycho. In fact, I was watching the first Psycho film, and then I was watching the remake that they did in the 90s, which is a shot-for-shot, shot, same script remake, which is really kind of interesting. Um, I don't think it was very successful, and uh, but it was it was legitimately exactly like the the first Psycho. They didn't change it. Like they decided to redo it, but not reboot it. You know, it's just different actors and better quality film. Um, soundtrack is the same. Like they use the same exact soundtrack at the same exact times, and the shots are almost all. I mean, I haven't watched it. I haven't synced it up and played it side by side to see how much it deviates, but it's pretty, very close, you know, uh, which is why it really wasn't a big success at the box office because uh, people just don't like that style anymore, I guess. Or, you know, in the 90s they didn't. But it was good. The actors did a good job. They replaced... The guy who played Norman Bates was... Uh, oh, I always blank on this guy's name. The the guy from Swingers, the let's go to Vegas. We're going to Vegas, baby. That guy. Um. But anyway, it, he did a good job. It was a relatively good, good remake. If you ever have a chance to check that out. Uh, but yeah, in that film, one of the guys gets in, and because it's a modern car, it's not as easy. <laughs> But they do the same shot, right? Because in the original, he gets in, slides over, drives off. And uh, because this was like a 90s car, uh, he gets in and like clumsily climbs over <laughs> over to the driver's seat. And it looks weird. Like you're just, like I was like, wait, why, why did he do that? And then I went and looked at the original. I was like, oh, that's why. Well, I guess that's sticking to the details, you know, but it just looked weird anyway. So I just noticed that in that last shot. In the uh, the standby footage that was playing, so I released a new video. It's only on BitChute because uh, it it does touch on some racial stuff. Uh, specifically, it talks about it, uh, it. I talked about Die Hard, and it was actually kind of funny because as I was writing the script for it, uh, Robin Riley on Twitter, she used to be CC Bucko. Um, she's like the trad mom kind of, I, mean, I don't want to just call her the trad mom, but I, I think you guys know who I'm talking about if I say that. Uh, but she start apparently she was watching Die Hard with her husband and started like live tweeting a lot of what I was writing in my script. And I was like, stop it. <laughs> like you're, you're, you're basically live tweeting the script I'm writing right now. So... Anyway, I guess it, it means I wasn't crazy with a lot of this stuff. But one of the things, and, and I encourage you to go check that out on BitChute, obviously. Uh, but one of the things that I talk about is something that's always bothered me about 80s movies. And it's not limited at all <laughs> to just Die Hard. It is not limited at all, to die, or even just to movies. It's just media. Media in starting in the late 70s. But hardcore in the 80s and hardcore in the 90s. Uh, and then it started to kind of trail off. And there's different reasons for that. But uh, one of the, the characters that you see over and over and over again is the black computer nerd. The black computer nerd. You know, the... 
I guess, proverbial Steve Urkel. The super nerdy black kid that no one knew in real life. But somehow he, he existed in, in great quantities in the Hollywood fictional universe. And it always annoyed me, even when I was a kid, because I was a nerdy white kid. And as a kid, like, I just knew, that's, this guy doesn't exist. This guy doesn't exist. It would be like if Hollywood, it would be like if I was a basketball player. And I, every time Hollywood showed a basketball game on TV or in a movie, it was all Asian kids. And like maybe, maybe a black guy, but like the, it'd be like if every single time everyone on, on both teams were, they were all Asian. I would be like, uh, what the fuck? Because it just, I mean, it just doesn't match up with reality. I'm telling you, like having gone to hacking conventions for several years, I have met Asian hackers but not, not even as many Asian hackers as I have met white hackers. Most hackers, by and large, are, are white guys. Nerdy white guys. And I've never, literally never, ever, 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 ever met a, a, a black hacker guy. Never. Never in a million years. Now, I'm not saying you can't be black and maybe, you know, be an outlier and become a hacker. Uh, it's probably more likely that you would be black and, and learn to code or something like that because they've made coding so easy. But, I mean, look, it's, it's like saying, I mean, look, there's no African software companies. There's no, Af there's no African car companies. There's, there's hardly really any African companies. So this idea that Hollywood insisted on casting every single nerd. Well, not every, but pretty much every single nerd in the big movies as a black guy means that they did, they, there was a reason behind that. They're not just doing that for no reason, Right. Like, if they were always casting Asians as basketball players, you'd be like, well, this is weird. This doesn't match up with reality. There has to be some other reason why they're doing this, because this isn't representative of of anyone's life experience. So it's not just that they're, they're borrowing from their life experience. This is just, there has to be some other reason why they're doing this. And, of course, they will tell you, well... We're doing this because ever since we forced integrated blacks with whites and it hasn't gone so well, uh, we need to fix the problem using propaganda. And uh, what we can what, what we mean by that is we'll just keep repeatedly showing all these black people in these positive or, you know, intellectually positive white roles. So if there's a doctor, you know, like uh, like the Cosbys, right? The Cosby Show, Bill Cosby, he's a doctor, right? Uh, his wife, I don't remember what she did. She's like a, I don't know, like a teacher or something like that, right? And, uh, you know, they'll act very white. And we'll, so we'll have an entire show that just has these positive white-like black people, and uh, when we have the opportunity to show like a, a hacker, you know, to encourage black people to get into computers, we'll, we'll show all these characters as, as, as black people. You know, so, so what's wrong with that, Devin? What's wrong with having these positive role models for black people to help them assimilate? Because the assimilation is not working. So we need to use our propaganda tools to help them assimilate. And the problem is 
first of all, that you're not going to fix this with this, with with your propaganda. You're, yeah, that's that's the first thing, right? But let's just let's just play your little game. Let's just say that okay. Your your argument is that these positive intellectual role models are going to have a a positive impact on the black community, right? That that's what you're saying that this the power of propaganda is so powerful that it can overcome biology. That's that's what you're saying. Okay. Well, then necessarily necessarily you are hurting the the white kids by depriving them of their positive role models, right? Because it's a zero sum game, right? Like there's 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 a finite amount of these characters. So if you're if you're casting every single one of these characters and Maybe it's not 100%, but pretty damn close. You're casting all of them as as these black people. Uh, not only, I, I would submit, are you injuring the, the white population who now no longer has these positive role models because, like I said, there's a finite amount of them. But you're also damaging society at large by depicting a unrealistic view of that demographic. And that includes that demographic itself. You are hurting black people now. Because if you think about it, let's say you're the black kid and you're watching all these movies and television shows and there's all these black super genius nerd inventor computer programmer guys and you're like well wait a second clearly this is something our people has a natural talent for because in every movie that I've seen in every television show I've watched uh, all the hackers and computer people are black so this is something clearly that I can do and yet I can't why is it that when I try to go get a job as a computer programmer or, or try to invent shit, like I, I'm not able to do it? What? Why? There must be some outside reason why I'm unable to accomplish this because according to popular culture, that, that would be, it's a totally normal thing that I could be doing this. You know what? It's probably because of those fucking racist white people. Why? Because those same movies that are telling him that he can be a computer programmer, super genius nerd guy are also telling him that it's because of the racist fucking white people that he's not successful, right? So not only does it deprive the white kids of the appropriate positive role model it creates an unrealistic expectation for the black kids which will necessarily lead to resentment it'll necessarily lead to resentment because it's giving them this expectation out of life that is completely out of step with reality and not because of racism, but because of limitation. I mean, you have to think about it. When we're talking about the, 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 these characters, we're talking about these characters are at the, the top 1% of, of the white bell curve. And there's not a whole lot of black people that can penetrate into that that part of the bell curve. Now, there's, there, there are black people that do, but they're extreme outliers. They're just as extreme 
uh, of an outlier. It would be statistically equal, or statistically equally as likely, if, again, the Hollywood film showed that every single basketball team was packed full of Asians. Now, you might have your random Yao Ming here and there, but that's going to be an extreme statistical outlier. And that's just, that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. And Hollywood, you'll see this on the left. The left excels at denying reality. They excel at denying reality. And, and when they encounter these problems of reality that thwart their preconceived notions on how the world should work, regardless of how it does work, it should work this way. And if they encounter a situation where, well, it doesn't work that way, well, there's got to be a way I can force it to work that way. There has to be a way that through, you know, the use of Hollywood propaganda in this instance, through social engineering, because this is the left's solution to everything, is through social engineering, we can acquire everything. We can acquire utopia. We can, we can get society to that Star Trek level of futuristic utopia and beyond that, really, through social engineering. Biology be damned. We're all the same. After all, race is, is simply is, is skin deep. And so if we play enough movies with black hacker guys, and we play enough TV shows with black doctors, eventually, that's what will happen. We'll have black hackers and, and black doctors all over the place. Now let's flip that around. Let's flip that around because in the case of Die Hard, and again, I highly recommend you go check out the video on BitChute. But in the case of Die Hard, and not just Die Hard, another popular theme in the 80s uh, wasn't just having the, the black hacker smart guy. You know, think again, think Terminator 2 did the same thing. The guy that invented Skynet, basically, was a black, you know, super genius. The flip side of that is the negative characters, the bad guy characters are always these very Aryan Germans, right? In the case of Die Hard, uh, in the case of uh, in Lethal Weapon, which is the same kind of a movie, you know, neurotic, hardcore white guy with, with um, you know, down-to-earth, smart black guy partner. You have... Uh, you know, they're not Germans, but they're all very Aryan looking. They're all very blonde. You know, Gary Busey is the, uh, the, the, the boss, not the boss, meaning like he's in charge, but like, he's like the, you know, the, the ultimate, you know, enemy that has to be defeated. Right. And, and so, okay. If you're trying to socially engineer positive things. If that's what you think you can accomplish through these positive uh, role models in these films, once again, we have to analyze why is it that all these, the bad guys, are a demographic that doesn't seem to add up? I mean, I, I've watched enough episodes of Cops and, uh, you know, like just paid attention to the news enough to know that there's there's not a lot of 
blonde hair, blue eyed, ubermensch, crime syndicates going around, you know, blowing up buildings and, and shit like that. That doesn't really, it just doesn't really exist. It seems out of step with reality. Seems a little weird. It seems weird that in movies like Beverly Hills Cop, that the bad guys are are all these, you know, well dressed white men, and the good guy is this kind of a criminal black guy. You know, just that just it just seems like the opposite of what what I've encountered in my life experience. So, why are you doing that? And again, the leftists will say, "Well, see, we're, we're again we we just don't want to paint these these demographics that are struggling in our society. The last thing we want to do is make it harder for them by by." Uh, uh, Showing crime as something cool or something, you know, good, you know. So we have to, to show the criminals as, as a different demographic because we don't want to encourage this already criminal behavior that, we're, that they're exhibiting. It's already a, you know, it's already a problem. <clears throat> you know, if we, uh, if we encourage it further, it'll just get worse. And again, you have to flip that around and say, okay, well, let's say, let's say that's the case, right? Well, then necessarily what that means is you are encouraging criminal behavior with whites. Because it, it's a zero-sum game. Once again, it's, if, if you're, if you're replacing, I mean, you're not replacing the criminals with, with robots, you know, you're replacing them with very Aryan, blonde, white people. So if it would affect black people in a negative way to have the criminals be black, then necessarily it's affecting white people in a negative way to have the criminals as white. And by the way, they would agree with that. They wouldn't say this. Because they're inconsistent uh, in public. But they would agree with that. But they would justify it to themselves this, in the same way that, you know, communists want to redistribute wealth uh, in the same way that they want to redistribute um, social wealth. Right? And this would be their way of doing it. They would say, well, yeah, obviously we're hurting white people, but white people need to be taken down a few pegs. You know? Obviously we want to elevate black people but we really what we want is we want them at the same level so if that means we need to lower white people to make it happen well then that's absolutely okay and that's exactly what they want you got to keep that in mind that it doesn't matter to them their goal is not to Let's elevate blacks to the level of whites because I suspect, especially at the top, they realize, well, that's just not going to happen. That's not, it's just not, it's, there's some biological hurdles that you, you can't, you can't get over. You, you just can't, you, all you have to do is look at uh, IQ statistics by race and it correlates exactly with crime statistics and everything else. That's, that's one of the first black pills I took. Because once you realize that, you realize, oh, okay, so this, you can't fix that. Because IQ is genetic. So there's some biological limitations you're dealing with, right? And so while the, the garden variety uh, leftist is, is never either, either, either never told this or, you know, manages to keep that out of their mind, the guys at the top, they know that, right? They know that. So what's their solution? Well, okay. Well, if that's the problem that we need to get over, uh, that you really only have a couple solutions. One is you have to kneecap 
the the higher performing genetics. But what's another solution? Why do you think there are so many ads promoting race mixing between black men and white women? And there, there are so many. Like, there are so many. Which is another thing that's way out of step with reality, right? Sure, that happens. It's not, I wouldn't even say it's an extreme outlier, but it's an outlier, right? It, the, the amount of black men with white women couples portrayed in media far exceeds the amount that you see in reality. So, clearly, once again, that's something they're trying to make happen. Why? Because it, it's a way of evening out that disparity. It's a way of evening out that genetic, that biological gap in ability. And it does precisely what, what this, this uh, propaganda is, is meant to do in that it lowers the ability of the, the white genetics and it raises the ability, the ability of the black genetics so that they meet in the middle, right? Oh, that's so racist. No, that's just... Come on. Everyone listening, including honest black people, come on. Everyone knows. Everyone knows. <laughs> you, maybe you're a pussy. You know what? I was thinking this yesterday. I was thinking the reason why everyone's afraid of being called a, a racist. Uh, why? Why is it? What? What? Let's let's just break it down to the basic reason. The basic reason the average person doesn't want someone pointing at them saying you're a racist. Well, it's fear, right? Fear. Right. That's. You're going to experience fear. If you're a normie and someone says you're a racist in public and points at you, your first reaction is going to be fear. Why? Because it's socially unacceptable. And that's it. It's socially unacceptable. If being a racist was as socially acceptable as... Someone who really prefers Mexican food to uh, Chinese food. Like, let's say you thought Mexican food was far superior to Chinese food. You had all these reasons why you thought that. Uh, and you felt very strongly about it. No one would care. No one would care. And even if your reasoning and your passion for this subject was equal to that of a racist, a racist who really preferred white people over, or Mexicans over Asians, right? Let's say there's a Mexican guy who really prefers Mexicans over Asians, and he has this big long list as to why, and he thinks that Mexicans are superior, and he's very passionate about it. Just as passionate as the guy who thinks Mexican food is superior, has the same list or same length of a list that's equally uh, as in-depth and is equally passionate about it. One guy is going to be afraid of his belief being discovered, and one guy's not. And in fact, if all you did, if all you did was remove that social stigma, all of a sudden, magically, the racist would be totally open about it. And, and honestly, everyone would care about as much as they care about the Mexican food in day-to-day -day life, right? Because it wouldn't affect them otherwise. But because power is 100% uh, 
uh, just a, a word that describes um, actions being controlled uh, or the power is the ability to inflict enough fear on someone that it, it controls their actions. That's it. Power is the ability to make another person, another group, you know, something else, an animal, so afraid of the consequences if they don't obey, that they obey. That's it. That's really it. That's all power is. If you don't have the ability to make someone afraid enough to do what you want, you have no power. That That's really it. Which, by the way, is why you have no power. Because <laughs> who's afraid of you, right? No one. The ruling class is not afraid of you. But you're afraid of them. And that's straight facts. Straight facts. Another thing that I, I brought up in that movie that I knew people would spurg out about, and they did, was uh, something that I get why they sparked out about it because there, there's, there's, I, I did, I, I actually, I, it's probably my fault because I don't think I explained. I really didn't explain it at all. I just kind of pointed it out and, and kept going, knowing that like people are going to spur out about this. And so, because I knew that, I probably should have addressed it better. But I'll address it now. Uh, early on in the film, uh, John McClane lights up a cigarette inside of the airport, like inside at, at baggage claim. He lights up a cigarette and just starts smoking. And that's something you could do in 1988, right? And I just pointed out that, like, look. You know, you might look at this and say, well, that's actually a good change because I don't want people smoking indoors. That affects me. And so I said, well, that's that's the same logic that that the left has been using to whittle away at your freedoms. They've been saying, well, I don't like your speech. That affects me. And I kind of kept going because I, you know, I. I don't know. I just thought I, I, like I said, I probably should have just left it, left it at that. Let me explain because I know that there's a lot of people who are many of them are ex-libertarians. Is the funny part? Who are so frustrated with the the uh, ineffectual nonsense that has come from the libertarians that they've they've decided to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And uh, with many of the, the right, because a lot of the right is, is just reacting to danger right now, sometimes the reaction's an overreaction, right? So I want you to think about, about this. It's not that freedom to smoke in an airport... <laughs> Is, is the sign of, of, a, of a healthy society or anything like that. It's that that is the logic that the left uses to wield uh, government power. That, well, this affects me, therefore I'm justified in using government power to stop it. And look, the right has been toying quite seriously with that as well. So well, we never really do that. And that's part of why we're in this mess. We need to start wielding more government power, you know, like to ban porn, for example, right? We should ban porn. That that would be, uh, you could say, well, what what's the difference? You know, like, so you want to ban porn, but, you know, you thought it was a good thing or you implied that it was a, a good thing that you could smoke in an airport. 
And, and what I want you to understand is neither porn bands or smoking bands would be necessary if we had the society that I want. Okay? Freedom and liberties don't have to be restricted by the government if you have a cohesive, homogeneous society that shares values. You don't have to ban porn in a country where everyone's Christian and thinks that porn is a sin. Right? You just don't have to. That's why the porn industry wasn't started by Christians. And actually, to this day, it's not operated by Christians. For those of you who don't know what I'm getting at, well, I'll just tell you, it's Jews. <laughs> like, it's not, look at who owns all the, the big porn companies right now. I mean, it's not, it's not a, I'm not memeing. Like, it's literally, they're all Jews. Everyone that, like Pornhub, all that stuff, it's all Jews. And uh, even if you go back to uh, the older uh, porn companies, it's Jews. If you live in a society that already agrees on certain values, and there's other mechanisms of enforcement, and you know, in, in this case, it's it's the church, right? You don't need the government to flex its muscles because the problem is you're not always going to be in charge of the government. So this is why I, I kind of, when people want to go full fash, I understand why. And I think that in a, in a temporary sense, it, it, it's almost necessary that something like that happens to solve the problem, Right. But I see it as like a transitional form of government because I, the, the problem is if you establish some kind of authoritarian government to solve all the problems that real, at this point literally have to be solved through fear and violence. Like, I mean, that's 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 really what you have to do. You have to have power uh, that you can flex and you, in, in an authoritarian way, you know, whether that's through a war or, or whatever. Right. But it, that's we have problems that you can't just argue your way out of, you know, or vote your way out of, right? Uh, but the problem is that would work in the short term. In fact, it'd probably work for my lifetime and maybe even my children's lifetime. It could work for a while, right? But eventually, the people that were that would be defining uh, what the blasphemy laws were and what the uh, the um, acceptable behaviors were and what, what speech to ban and all that sort of a thing, eventually those people would be far out of step with what I would want. Because these kind of institutions, these top-down kind of, these institutions always corrupt. Always. So it would have an expiration date to it. And then it would be catastrophic for, for your children because you would be on the receiving end. It would, be, it would be the communists at the top that would, I mean, they would weasel their way in. Like I said, who knows how long it would take, but eventually they would do it. When you look at freedom and liberty-based systems, they don't fail because of the freedom and liberty. They fail because they don't preserve the demographics. They don't preserve uh, the people that are able to live responsibly under those conditions. And because every time someone ir is so irresponsible that they go so far outside the norm that the government has to step in and pass another law, you know, it whittles it away slowly and slowly and slowly. 
And a lot of that's because uh, of, well, because of immigration, you know, like it, you know, the freedom based, liberty based governments and those systems also have an expiration date. You know, if, if they keep letting in random people and they fail to preserve the uh, ideals and the culture and uh, the other governing bodies like the, the churches that are able to uh, govern without the force of, of violence, they use, uh, well, they use shame. I guess it's still, in a way, it's violence. In a way, it's still fear, right? But it's fear through social shame. Uh, not fear through, you know, getting shot or hung. So when I pointed out in Die Hard that, oh, look, in 1988, <clears throat> excuse me, you could still smoke in an airport. And the logic that was used to remove that is the same logic that leftists have used to get rid of your free speech, just as an example. Uh, that's still true. Doesn't mean I want smoking in airports. It just means you have to be aware of that. You have to understand that when you have these top-down authoritarian uh, systems, they're only good if you control them, <laughs> you know, the moment that they slip outside of your control, because in 1988 or whatever, whatever it is, they banned the smoking in the airports. You could say, well, that's a good thing. All right. But then when that same power that was wielded to remove smoking from airports is then wielded using the exact same logic to remove your speech. Just understand that. That's all I'm saying. Understand that that's exactly what the reasoning that, the, that they use. They say, well, you know, your speech, it's dangerous. It, it creates a public health or, or the vaccine. That's literally the exact argument for the vaccine. Oh, well, you have to take the vaccine. If you don't, you're, you're putting other people around you in danger. So I want people to understand that. That's, that's what I was getting at. And, I, and again, I knew people would spurg out about it because there is a lot of frustration on the right about the, the right's inability to effectively wield power. And I get that. And I'm not even saying that that the right shouldn't want to do that or even shouldn't do that. I'm just saying you got to under. It's a complex issue. It's not as simple as uh, banning bad things is good. You know, we should live in a society that bans all bad things. Well, who defines what the bad things are? That's that's the, that's the that's the rub. You know. It's like Carl Schwab, right? He wants the, the great reset where, where you don't own anything, you don't have any privacy, but it's okay because you're happy. You, you want to know why you're happy? Because Carl Schwab decided what happiness is. And while you don't own anything, Carl Schwab owns something. It's because someone owns it, right? So, if someone has to own this stuff. It might not be you, but someone has to own it. And look, if maybe maybe if Carl Schwab was was Jesus, <laughs> his plan would work. You know, if his intentions were pure, but even if his intentions were pure, some of the worst shit happens with the best intentions. Because you know what, I think a lot of these guys, their intentions—I don't know if they're they're pure, but I don't think that they're totally trying to enslave everybody. They've either they've convinced themselves or someone has convinced them that this is a good thing for society ultimately, just like the, the smoking thing. Like, no, this is better. It's better. Trust us. We know better than you. 
that you shouldn't be smoking in airports. So we're just gonna we're just gonna ban that because you can't handle that. And, and by the way, look, as society degenerates, they got a point. Maybe maybe people could handle it at first. That's why it wasn't like a big deal. Like because in the 1950s, well, part of it maybe everyone smoked, right? So it wasn't that big of a deal. But the other part of it was too, people were polite. I mean, look, when I was a kid, there was. You could smoke in restaurants, and you could smoke in bars and stuff like that, right? You could still smoke in a few places. I don't, I don't know if there's anywhere in the country you can still do that, but like when I was a kid, you could, and it wasn't that big of a deal, you know. People weren't like walking up to you and blowing fucking smoke in your face, right? And I would, I would submit that probably, especially. Initially, when people were, were doing... Because people have been smoking in America a really long time. They think it's like a new thing. No, I mean, tobacco, I think, comes from America, right? It's an American plant. So, it, 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 we were smoking and chewing tobacco. I mean, to give an idea. Mormons had spittoons in their first temple. I mean, that's... Everyone was chewing tobacco, even the Mormons back in the day. You know, like, tobacco has been around a long fucking time. So, it's not a new thing. It's just that people were, because you're in a cohesive, polite society, people were cool about it. You know, they didn't, they didn't make a, they weren't blowing smoke in your face and being assholes about it. And maybe, and I don't know, but maybe as society started to, you know, go off the rails and people stopped giving a shit about each other. They were less polite about it. They were more annoying about it. They were, they were more selfish about it. Until eventually, enough people got annoyed with it to where they asked the government to step in. And that's how every, that's how every law, that's how every freedom goes away. Every single freedom, including, you know, speed limits. That's how every freedom goes away. Is it's like everyone, it's a free for all, but then enough people, you know, cross the social line enough to annoy enough other people to where government takes it away. You know, it's like when I was a kid, my mom gave me a, 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 a toy snake that I wanted. It was like this rubber snake. And she hated it and and didn't like that I had it. But I begged really, I really wanted it, right? So she got it. And the second I gave her a reason to take it away, she did. Because I used it like as a whip since <laughs> smacked my fucking sister with it. <laughs> Don't get too mad. I was like, I was like six or something when I did this. And uh, I still remember being out like just like... <laughs> <laughs> like, oh no, she's taking it away. And, uh, you know, that's, that's how government works. They let you have it. They don't like it. But the second you give them a reason or someone else gives them a reason to take it away, it's gone. And which, by the way, also explains why they want society to be more and more sensitive. More and more sensitive to everything because it's easier to, to get them to be outraged. It's easier to get public support for more, authorita more authorita uh, authoritarian shit. It's easier to whip them up into a frenzy and support your ban on whatever. If they're all these little fucking sensitive babies. So those are the things that I wanted to expand on in that video because that video is not super long. Well, it's, it's like 15 minutes long or so. 
But really, with those with the Die Hard films, I mean, there's four of them. I watched all four. It wasn't worth it to to deep dive on each and every one because it would get kind of repetitive. But it was definitely worth it to to talk about uh, some of the repetitive themes that you see in each one of them. The, the, the only one that really broke away from that formula of, uh, you know, white guy. You know, the, here's the other funny thing is if you think about it, uh, we, you know, we talked about the the positive role model of the, the, the black hacker nerd guy, right? And the negative uh, role model of the German evil, maniacal bad guy. But what about uh, Bruce Willis himself? What about John McClane? He's white, right? Isn't he exactly the kind of white guy that the ruling class wants? Now, this isn't something that I talk about at all in the video. But it's something I, I was thinking about. Think about about and he's this is he this he plays the same character in all four movies, right? This would apply to all four movies. Think about I'm sure you've seen at least one of these movies. Think about John McClane as as a character. Like how would you how would you describe him? You know, other than just, you know, he's a white middle-aged, uh, you know, boomer that, you know, cop that can do extraordinary feats of heroism and, and doesn't seem to be able to die, right? No, I mean, he's, he's also, he's an erotic mess, right? He's, he's uh, an alcoholic, his marriage is in, is, is in shambles. His personal life is a disaster. He is a, verbally abused by every authority figure in his life. But at the end of the day, he still sacrifices what little he does have for everybody else. At the end of the day, he gives everything that he has to save the woman who doesn't appreciate him, who ends up leaving him. To save the, in part two, to save all of the, the lives of the people on the airplanes who will never know that he ever existed. You know, even save the lives of people that get in his way if they're ultimately good. That's what they that's what they want out of the average white guy. The the ruling class, that's like the perfect white guy, right? The perfect white guy is a guy who yeah, he can joke about how he, you know he doesn't like authority and how he knows more than all of his bosses and how they're all just idiots. And his wife doesn't really love him. His, his personal life is a fucking mess. What the ruling class really wants, though, is this broken man 
who consistently sacrifices everything, including his own life, on a regular basis, over and over and over again, for them. In fact, quite literally, in uh, Die Hard 3, he's sacrificing everything for the Federal Reserve. Now that would be, I didn't really bring that up in the video either. Die Hard 3 would be a, a movie to analyze in and of itself. It's just because it takes the racial shit to like a whole new level with Samuel L. Jackson and, and, uh, and all that. But also, people forget this. <laughs> everything he's doing, everything he's doing in the movie, you know, almost dying constantly, almost getting blown up, getting shot at, thrown off of buildings and run over by cars and, you know, everything. Like, stabbed, beat up. At the end of the day, he's doing all that to save the Federal, Federal Reserve's gold. The New York Federal Reserve Bank's gold. That's what he's... That's what the, why he's going through hell... The entire movie. Because he's sacrificing himself for the Federal Reserve's gold. John McClane is the perfect alpha slave. That's exactly the kind of person they want white people emulating. You can joke around and grumble and complain and get drunk and have a divorce and your life can be a mess. That's all fine. Whatever. Do what you want. As long as at the end of the day, you're willing to do whatever it takes to save the Federal Reserve's gold. That's what they want. That's That's why they let John McClain be white. Well, that and financial reasons, I don't think the movie would have it, which by the way, that, that was another interesting thing. It really wasn't that big of a, a financial. I mean, it made money, but it wasn't a huge hit when it first came out. It's one of those movies that they gained in popularity after it went out on video. And now I think it's nostalgia just because it has masculinity in it at all. You know, so often now we're we're uh, surrounded by these films. See, because here's the thing now. Now, the, 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 before in the 80s and the 90s, they wanted all the white guys to be John McClane. Well, now they want the white girls to be John McClane. So you get Wonder Woman. The same thing. It's the same PSYOP. It's just that now, because it's women in the workforce, that's who they want to go through the ringer in order to save the Federal Reserve's gold. And women make way better consumers. Women make way better alpha slaves. So that's why you're seeing that that shift in films because I and again part of that's financial too, right? In the same way that if in Die Hard they made the main character a black guy, it wouldn't have made nearly as much money. Uh if they made the main character a woman, it probably would have made even less money in 1988. Uh nowadays uh I think and it's hard to know, right? Because they don't do this. I think if they were to to have made... If you had an alternate universe, right? And a lot of these movies 
that they rebooted with women like Ghostbusters or even like the Star Wars that's become just like soaked in estrogen. If all they had done is cast these female characters as men and just, you know, alter the alter the like, script just enough to where like it's not weird that they're saying female lines. But like uh, by and large, you don't really change very much else, right? If you had this alternate universe where, like, all these movies that flopped, that's all you did, is you just swapped it out with a guy, and uh, so it's not some 90-pound woman doing acrobatic ass-kicking, or it's not like, uh, you know, women just acting like men and, and performing like men in, to an unrealistic degree. If you If that's all you switched out... In this alternate universe. I suspect that, you know, some of these movies, they suffered other problems. Just bad writing and everything else. But uh, I suspect they would have been a lot more popular. <sighs> Had to take a little drink of water there. All right, so let's take a look at chat. You know, I'll even open the chest. How about that? How about that? Open the chest. Let's see here. Open the chest. There we go. Boom. It has been opened. Rick Moranis got polar bear hunted. Yeah, I saw that he got punched out in New York. That was a while back. Rick Moranis is, is Jewish. Not sure. A lot of people think of him as Canadian. And he is, I guess he's Canadian as well. There we go. Let's take a look at... What do I think of The Crow? You know... I haven't seen it in so long. I remember thinking it was kind of gay when I saw it because I saw it like a really long time ago and I could never really get into it. But I just I just thought that the character was kind of kind of gay seeming because it just seemed like and maybe I'm totally wrong. As, like, I don't remember much about it. I just kind of got the vibe from the crow, the same kind of vibe that like that those those vampire movies that they make for girls, you know, where it's like the the dark brooding vampire guy. Like I kind of just got that from the crow where it was just like, he's like this dark brooding faggot kind of, but again, <laughs> maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. I'd have to rewatch it. Cause it's been over 10 years since I've seen that movie. I don't, I don't even remember the plot to it. I wasn't super. Uh, I wasn't super. I know. I remember that he died, right? The actor died, like they shot him on the set. They used, uh, there's like a whole conspiracy about that where they had prop guns and one of them had real bullets and they, they shot him dead on the, uh, on the set. Uh, or maybe that was in part two that they killed him. Yeah. Brandon Lee, it was Bruce Lee's son, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 but again, I haven't looked into it beyond that. It was just a long time. I remember just, like I said, I watched part of it. I don't even know if I saw the whole thing. I just kind of was like, oh, this is kind of like a girl movie. <laughs> you know, like, and maybe I'm wrong. It was just, it just seemed kind of like a little too girly. Um, but I, I have it. I'm pretty sure I've got it. I, I'd have to rewatch it. I got like a stack of, you know. Carl's house, the really gross place with all the porn. It also had uh, a bunch of DVDs, like endless DVDs. Now, most of the DVDs were weird old black and white movies, uh, which is, you know, I guess that's okay. But uh, I would have preferred maybe better movies. There's also a bunch of VHS movies. And I've got, I've got, I have a lot of old video equipment. I can watch beta. I can watch anything. I have the ability to read any format. 
Well, there's people saying that the crow is is badass. I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. Not worthy of one of your reviews. I don't know. Are you talking about the crow? Maybe. Maybe. It, maybe. I, I'd be okay with watching it again. I've got it. Like I said, there, there's a. I think I have the sequel too. Let's see here. Everyone's talking about. You know, let's, people are always talking about book two. I know. I know. I know. It. Like I said. Part, like it, all right. To give you an idea of one of the reasons why I haven't, I haven't put it out, is I don't know what's happening with Trump, and it's one of those things where it'll be, it'll be like very tone deaf if things go one way, <laughs> and and because uh, I want it to be relevant, right? Like. It's it's fiction, sure, and it's it's there for entertainment, sure, but it's also there to think about some certain you know about stuff, and it has to be relevant to what the hell's going on, and book one does that. It's relevant to what happened, you know, back in 2016 and and beyond, and and I want book two to be relevant to what's happening now, and uh, you know I made a lot of changes to it just because 2020 was such a fucking crazy year. And I kept I kept thinking, well, things will settle down enough to where at least you can you can have like a, a somewhat clear view as to where things are going, right? So you can you can kind of send off the uh, the characters in that direction. But I don't know what's going to happen. And uh, I could just say fuck it because it is it, you know it's a fictional universe, right? So if my universe goes in a different direction than reality, it's not the end of the world. But it does, it will make book three harder to put together and make relevant. I don't know. And maybe, and maybe I'm just being too nitpicky about that kind of a thing. It's just that, I don't know. Like it's, I want it to be, I want it to be more than just entertainment. I want it to be useful to people and, and I want it to address things that are relevant and, and, uh, well, I suspect I know how things are going to go in January. There's still a lot of giant question marks, you know. Uh, I think even after January 6th, we're not going to know until January 20th, really, what's happening. And there's going to be some important things people are going to have to, like, consider. There was a lot of things in book one that I wanted people to think about that we could only discuss in the context of fiction. And there will be a lot of things I'll want people to think about that we'll only be able to discuss in the context of fiction if things go a certain way in January. So that's that's why it's it's kind of I got I, I got my finger on the pause button and I'm just like looking looking at the <laughs> looking at the footage on the screen to see if I can release the pause button or if I have to hit stop, you know. <laughs> so it's it's one of those situations. Um, all right, let's see here. Say hello to President Harris. Yeah, very, very likely. Very likely. Uh, very likely. And, you know, the weird thing that I've noticed, like I said, and this is what I suspect. I, you know, I did that whole video about the Howard Post rule of law, and we are. And I think that that would be kind of what would happen uh, you know, and that's what's going to happen. Well, that's what's been happening, and that's what's going to happen in January, or continue to happen in January, right? Uh, we're in this post rule of law era to where the ruling class just said, fuck it, we're just doing whatever we want, and no one's going to stop us. So, why bother, you know, just keep going with it, right? And, uh, that's so I suspect that's kind of what, what's going to happen, and uh, it, it's you know, I'm trying to find out. I want to confirm this. I may have jumped the gun a little bit, but I'm pretty sure I'm right on this. So Trump cocked out and signed the relief bill yesterday, right? I think it was yesterday. You know, the, the one, the $600 one that everyone was complaining about. I don't really care about that one way or the other. Uh, I'm not going to get any of that money. 
so it, it's it's not you know it doesn't it doesn't affect me but the uh the the thing that i do care about is all the stuff that they added to that bill right all the stuff they tacked onto that that bill and, and by the way another reason i don't care is it's a drop in the bucket six hundred dollars or two thousand dollars for the people that are affected by this stuff really i mean so oh instead of being able to pay half of one month's rent I can pay one and a half months rent. You know what I mean? Like that's, is that really, is that going to really change things fundamentally for anybody out there? I don't know. Maybe some people it'll get them by a little bit longer, but it's still bullshit, right? Uh, especially, you know, how much money these bankers are getting and stuff like that. So anyway, the, the thing that the, one of the things they slipped in the bill and this is, this is real. This is confirmed. Uh, I don't know that it, 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 when it was in, the, like, they put this in in the house, right? And they never sent it back to the house to remove it. And I don't think the president has the ability to do, like, line item vetoes. So I th I think it's, it's he signed this. I think when he signed the relief bill, he signed this. Uh, let me bring it up here. But what he signed, because what they added to the bill and the reason why it's been so hard to find it is they I mean they make it really difficult to just find the text of this uh, this bill I found like even on the official website they broke it up into like 10 different PDFs and it you don't get even and it, you kind of get the impression that there's more that that it's not in these PDFs they're like there's no one place where you're like okay where's the whole fucking bill all I want is the bill that got signed into law in like one PDF. Can we have that so I can, I don't know, read what the law is now? And you would think that would be an easy thing to find on the internet. And maybe it is, and I just don't know where to look. But I looked for it for a little bit of time yesterday. And I, like I said, I found bits and pieces of it. And I couldn't confirm that it's, this part of it stayed. But anyway, back when it was in the house... The House voted on and passed an amendment to it that changed the Insurrection Act in a very uh, substantial and relevant way. So if Trump signed it with this in it, this is what he signed. He signed an amendment that required certifications to be made to Congress when the president deploys active duty military within the United States during civil unrest by amending the Insurrection Act in Title 10, Chapter 13 of the U.S. Code. The vote to approve or reject the amendment was, I mean, it, it was approved. 53% to 47%. You know, it was 215 Democrats and... And one Republican voted for it, and only, you know, 14 Democrats voted against it, and 176 Republicans voted against it. So it passed, and it got added to the bill. And again, maybe along the way it got removed. I couldn't find any confirmation that it was removed, and uh, it's hard to find. It's hard to see like the bill in its final form. And even if you could find it, it's long as fuck, right? So uh, you could search for words like insurrection and, you know, stuff like that. But I mean, it doesn't mean that they haven't reworded it in such a way that you can't, the, the word insurrection isn't in it. You know what I mean? Like they could, they could reword it. And, and I haven't had the, obviously I haven't had the time to even skim through the, the fucking, 5,000 pages or whatever it is. Nor can I even find it. So if President Trump signed the relief bill and this was still in it, and I'm pretty sure it is, <laughs> you know, he just signed away his ability to deploy troops in, in any kind of martial law situation. 
So, and knowing Trump, I mean, look, I mean, just the way it's gone so far with this guy, it just seems like a Trump thing to do, <laughs> you know, like that he would just, that he would just fucking sign this sh- stupid shit and he'd be like, oops, oh, well, womp, womp, you know, like, <laughs> So I think that that's that's quite possible that that Trump chopped his own dick off by signing that by being a cuck. That's the worst part is they didn't even sneak it into a bill that he that he wanted. Like they snuck it into a bill that he went on TV and complained about and then signed anyway. <laughs> Oh, man. Fucking Trump. Fucking Trump. So, yeah, that's that's something we got to that, that might that might have an impact on, on uh, what happens in January. That, that, that might change the options available to. I don't even think that that's something that he's he's even thinking about doing, though. I really don't. I know there's a lot of people around him that want to do that, but I don't think that's I don't think he wants to do that. And, and and if he even if he did, I don't think that he'd have the the ability to do it simply because, uh, in the same way, Trump seems to have literally no control over the FBI or the CIA or the NSA or the DOJ or the State Department or the NICHD. Like you know, like it just seems like he has no control over any of the agencies. So why would he have control over the military? I mean, they're giant cucks. You know, in the military, if you say "Make America Great Again," you, it's you can get in trouble. What? Yeah, yeah, that's real. <laughs> that's real. And if you don't believe me, maybe maybe you'll believe Tucker Carlson. People seem to like him still for some reason. Let me pl- let me play that clip. You want you want to be black pilled on the military a little bit? Let me show you a little bit of, of uh, if I still have that clip. Yeah, I think this is it. Yeah, so so get ready for, uh, for this black pill. This summer, the U.S. Army's so-called Operation Inclusion instructed soldiers that the phrase Make America Great Again was a form of, quote, socially acceptable covert white supremacy. A presidential campaign slogan was white supremacy, according to the Army. Again, no one did anything about that. Now, according to the Army's Equity and Inclusion Agency, and yes, they have one, the phrases all lives matter, American exceptionalism, and the celebration of Columbus Day are racist. This is from the Army. The people are supposed to be protecting you. The head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Lieutenant General Robert Ashley, recently encouraged his employees to read the lunatic track White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, a book that is inherently bigoted and also stupid. Again, This is the military supposed to be protecting you. Instead, they're reading White Fragility. Over the summer, Caleb Wright, the chief master sergeant of the Air Force at the time, proclaimed on Twitter that his greatest fear was that one of his airmen might be killed by a racist cop. Not killed by the Chinese military, but by American racism. And so on. Where does this end? Can you protect a nation with the military like this? And we're back, I think. I think we're back. Are we back? Yeah, it says no drop frames. Okay, we're back. So anyway, hopefully I didn't lose everybody. You might have to refresh. I'll tell you guys to refresh. Refresh. Okay, we're back. I don't have to tell you guys. So anyway, you could say that, uh, what was I talking about? The military. All right. So with the military thing, even, even if Trump has some people loyal within the military that, that are willing to do what he wants, there's an infinite amount of people who aren't. And that would necessarily plunge us into a hot civil war. And it would be messy. It'd be messy as fuck. And I think you underestimate 
the ruling class, and yes, Trump is a member of the ruling class, whether you like it or not. The ruling class's uh, desire to maintain the status quo. Because you're talking about if you had a hot civil war that was to the degree that we're talking about, where you're having like, uh, you know, people shooting at each other, military, like, I mean, if you had some parts of the military supporting Trump and some parts of the military not supporting Trump, and like the article I was, I was talking about, I think it was the New York Times, there are people that, I mean, the people on the right aren't the only ones that think that, oh, we might, you know, civil war might be imminent. It's not just the boomers that were on ham radio, which I'll play that clip here in a second. It's kind of funny. It's not just the boomers on ham radio that uh, think that civil war is imminent. Okay, it's not just the right wing people that are kind of like getting a little, little antsy. Okay, it's people on the left. They sense it. They know it. They're not stupid. And there are a lot of left wing people in the military. And they're, according to this New York Times article, and, and I, again, you can call it fake news, but I, I it seems totally within the realm of possibility to me. There are people within the military making contingency plans already, preparing for a, a possibility that Trump tries to uh, send what would amount to a military coup, you know? Legally speaking, it'd be a military coup. Now, would it be a justified military coup? Probably. I mean, if you believe in the voter fraud stuff, which I happen to. Um, but it, it wouldn't, it doesn't change the fact that it would turn into like a big bloody mess. And, Trump it has has his own selfish motivations, okay, like anybody else. And if his choices are, well, I can be fucking Oprah rich until the day I die, and all my kids will be Oprah rich until the day they die. Uh, we're not going to get prosecuted. They've already signaled hardcore that they're not going to try to, like, prosecute him if he just goes away. That he has that choice, or his other choice is what? To maybe get killed, <laughs> you know, to to real to really hope he wins the, his coup. Because if he doesn't, they would at that point literally destroy him and his family if if he lost. And don't think that we're just automatically going to win if 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 it turned into something like that. And even if we did, the, 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 the probability, it's not 100%. Whereas Trump can say, well, one of my decisions will leads to a probability of 100% that I'll be happy and rich till I die. And my kids have a dynasty. And we can live to fight another day, as one person once said, that is really a cucked way of looking at things, but whatever. That's one choice. That's one possibility. Or, alternatively, I can maybe die. <laughs> My family dies. And the country is, is wrecked. And then, you know, in terms of authoritarianism from the left, if they won, which I don't, I don't think that they would, but, like, they could. You, you think it's going to be bad? If they... If, if, if they uh, if they're president, you know, if Biden's president, it's going to be really bad if they win a coup type scenario. Then they really will put you in camps. And not because of some weird FEMA camp conspiracy theory, but because of history. Just ask the South how nice it was living in the South after the Civil War, <laughs> you know. So it's. Uh, it just seems it, it seems highly unlikely that Trump goes that route for a, a, a almost limitless reasons. Now it, it could still go down. I don't know. That's why. That's why I don't know. That's why I'm waiting for the sixth. And even then, it's like I'll be waiting for the twentieth. <laughs> it's because it's I'll, I'm waiting for January to be over. January is going to be a fucked up month, one way or the other, and I don't I don't know which way. 
Yeah, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I wish that I knew what was going to happen. I would certainly uh, be more relaxed. Just if I knew. Because I'm prepared either way. And you should be too. Uh, I, I just, I don't like not knowing. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think the country, and by the way, in the context of COVID, the, and, and just the ability, since they, they do, they have the ability to shut down the internet. They have the excuse of COVID to, to shut things down. Things could get really weird and really bad, really fast, really easily. But lots of people sense this, so I'm gonna play. A little, I'm gonna play a little uh, video that I put on Instagram, Telegram, and Twitter, and then I'm gonna wrap things up here. Uh, but one of the things I've noticed while listening to ham radio at night, uh, which I do from time to time, is that a lot of the boomers. Uh, by the way, I thought this is a bit interesting thing too. I thought that most, well, you know, most of the boomers on ham radio, they're all right wing. You know, a lot of them are, are, you know, if they're into ham radio, a lot of them are prepper types and stuff. That's not true. There's actually a lot of Biden supporters, believe it or not, on ham radio too. And they get in these arguments and they're both stupid, right? So it's just listening. It's like, it's like, remember that first debate between Trump and Biden, how it just looked like fucking junior high school kids yelling at each other. Like it was just really kind of embarrassing for both sides. Like it was just, it was just watching old men fling spaghettios at each other from across the table at the nursing home, you know, and, and that's, that's what it sounds like on ham radio sometimes now where you have like the, it's just like the boom, the most boomer takes in the world uh, on both sides getting flung back and forth. And it's just horrifying. But anyway, there are, I'd say slightly more of the Trump supporters and that depends on what band you're on and stuff like that. But I've noticed that a lot of, uh, boomers in the Trump camp, whereas before they were talking about, you know, being worried about, and by the way, the, both sides on ham radio, is, and this is an age thing, they're both terrified of COVID. <laughs> they fear the boomer remover. But anyway, so the, uh, the, uh, they're, 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 they're all freaking out. They're all freaking out uh, about civil war now. And that, that wasn't the case before. You know, like they 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 seem to think that that uh, even, that, you know, after the election initially. They I, I didn't see like a big response. It wasn't until all the fraud stuff came out, like the first couple days after the election, I, I tuned in because I wanted to be like, oh, how is this going to affect the these boomer guys? And a lot of them were just kind of like, well, I guess that's it. You know, I guess we're going to be socialists now or whatever, you know, like, you know, uh, but it wasn't, but that was it. It was, they were just, okay, well, we lost. And now it's not like that. Now it's like, you know, good thing I have my guns. You know, they're, they're trying to steal this. The legitimacy of the Biden win is no one's buying it. At least, I mean, half the country isn't buying it. And that's a really dangerous position for a country to be in. And so I'll play. I think I have it here. I think I have it. If I don't, I'll pull it off my telegram. But let me see if I got it here. Oh, yeah. I do have it here. So this is what I've experienced lately. Boomers on the radio. That where all these flip cards come from all of a sudden. Boomers on the radio. Make the comment about the Second Amendment right. If uh, you lose that, you're going to lose every single right we've got. Boomers on the radio. That is what it's all about. Is to protect ourselves from our own government. Boomers on the radio. Oh, Roger, we just got we just got to pray for Trump. We just got to pray for our uh, our uh, brave president. He's the only one fighting in there. Him and his son and Rudy, and that's about it. Everybody else is kind of just against them. But anyway, Boomers on the radio. Uh, that's not that's going on right now. A civil 
Boomers on the radio. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I am so sick and freaking tired of some of these knuckleheads. Uh. Boomers on the radio. <laughs> Boomers on the radio. Yes, that was Boomers Gone Wild. And if, if you couldn't hear, if you couldn't hear the, uh, I know there's some people that don't, I listen to, it's really easy for me to understand everything they said because I listen to ham radio a lot, so I can pull out, and I listen to noisy ham radios. I don't have any of these new ham radios. All my radios are older than me. So uh, what they were saying was Civil War is imminent, and if, you know, if we lose the Second Amendment, we'll lose everything. And uh, there's actually more. I, I mean, that that was just, that was clipped out of, I think, like 10 minutes I listened to. And they went into detail about, you know, for my cold, dead hands, you know, that kind of talk. Now, look, maybe they're all talk. It seems like conservatives and certainly conservative boomers have been all talk for decades. So I get that. Uh, but I haven't heard this kind of talk. I haven't, not to this degree. Yeah, I mean, there's always been like the, the, they better not take our guns, you know, but like they're, trust me, I've been listening to boomers talk about politics for a long time and the the degree to which they're willing to go there <laughs> is certainly new. It's It's no longer like crazy Uncle Ned who, you know, goes moose hunting in Alaska and and, uh, you know, just is always thinking the government's trying to get them. It's all of them are like that now. Every boomer's crazy Uncle Ned right now, you know. <laughs> so, uh, well, I mean, as we as we may discover with the RV bomber guy, right? Like, I don't know. We don't know. It's it's the fog of war going on with that, right? But that very easily could be crazy Uncle Ned boomer bomber for all we know. That would, that I would, I would totally not find that hard to believe, to be perfectly honest. I know there's a lot of people, everything's fake. You know, the danger with people finding out that like there's a few lies is sometimes they 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 slide into the, the territory of, well, that if that's a lie and that's a lie, if they lied about this, which was really big, and this, which was really, they must have lied about everything. Everything's a lie now. And everything's a false flag and everything's fake. And it's like, no, <laughs> not everything's fake. Not everything's a lie. And there's a lot, there's a lot of big whoppers, you know, uh, there, there's so many, there's like, there's probably like 6 million whoppers at least, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, not everything's a lie. Not everything's a lie. Some things are just you know, like the Sherlock Holmes thing. Sometimes the simplest explanation is the right one, you know, and uh, I would not be terribly surprised, especially given the uh, the the circumstances around that I, I would not be terribly surprised if if the uh, RV thing was like a a boomer suicide bomber type of thing I, we'll find out more as we find out more about that guy they're saying it was um I find it interesting that it was it was whoever did it went really out of their way to make sure it wasn't a mass casualty event so that was odd that makes you think I feel like if it was like a quote unquote false flag, that would not have been a consideration, you know. Uh, I think things might just be getting weirder out there. All right, so let me take a look at the uh, take a look at the the chat here, and then we'll wrap things up. Yeah, people make it a lot about. A, a lot out of his name. Nah, I'm not that. Yeah, sorry. Sometimes things are just. Sometimes there are there are such things as coincidences. Okay. <laughs> sometimes there just are. You know, like the 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 whole. That's the other thing. Everything's a lie. Everything's fake. There's no such thing as coincidences. No, so there is. 
Sometimes there are. You know, that's it's not a meaningless word. It's not a made up word. It's there's really a use for that word to describe a very real phenomenon. Sometimes there's just sometimes just shit happens. Not everything needs to have a complicated explanation or reason behind it. Sometimes shit just happens. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, maybe maybe it'll turn out that it's something weird and crazy, but um, we got to wait and see until we have more more data. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I look at everything very skeptically. Yeah, well, you know, you should. Uh, their control on information and misinformation is their greatest weapon. Yeah, well, and, and that's why people fall into that trap. It's like, well, they lie so much that everything must be a lie. And it's like, well, I, you know... Look, I mean, especially when you're first getting red pilled or black pilled or whatever you want to call it, as soon as the second like you start to realize how 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 deep it goes, like as it's it is deep, it's bad. It is really easy to keep sliding down the hole beyond like where the bottom actual bottom is, <laughs> you know, because you don't know. It's like it's a lot of this stuff, and even you know what we'll we'll never really know. Well, honestly, we'll never really know with the RV thing. Just like we'll really never know with Vegas. We'll never really know with Seth, oh, with Seth Rich. We'll never really know with the Awan brothers. We'll never really know with any any of this stuff. Because they are liars. And it makes people crazy. And that's part of why they do it. And and you just have to realize, even, even if we get a clearer picture and we can maybe have a better educated guess as to what happened with the RV guy, we'll never really know. And moreover... No one will care in like a year. Just like no one, no one remembers the, remember the MAGA bomber? Do you remember that guy? No, no, of course you don't. Everyone forgot about that guy. Most people don't even know who the Alwan brothers are. You know, everyone, everyone will cares a lot right now. In a year, especially the way things are going, you're going to be like RV bomber. What? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's just not going to matter. It's not going to fucking matter. Um, the big plan is to make us all crazy. Yeah, really, kind of. It is. It, it's they're trying to gaslight you, make you crazy, it makes you easier. It makes you a a, a, a softer target. It makes you a, a you're you're less able to uh, uh, withstand their their control methods if you're all tightly wound and confused all the time. Uh, let's see here. I disagree. The RV bomber will go down in history. No, probably not. Not any more than the Vegas shooter. Not any more than any of these other guys. You know, that, and you can make the argument that the Vegas shooter should go down in history. And if we knew the whole backstory and what really happened, maybe... Maybe he would, but we don't know. We we'll never know what what the deal is with that. And with with the Vegas shooter, that was a mass casualty event, and we still people forgot that even happened. The RV thing, like maybe one guy died, and we and it might be the guy who did it. We don't even know. But like, it not you know, it fucked up like an AT and T building. And no, I'm not even like getting get into all that bullshit. Or shit that may or may not be bullshit. Who knows? Vegas will because he broke your record. This RV didn't. Well, I don't know. Like I said, people don't even remember Vegas already. Supersonic base. I have glowy fatigue. Well, I, I, I get, see, here's the other thing that's really frustrating is I get, one of the reasons why I know that everything is a psyop and everything, I I get, I got accused, not as much these days, but there was a while they were like, especially the Q people when they were still really trusting the plan, there was more of them. I was like part of the deep state for a while, according to these people, you know, like I was part of these uh, Q-spiracies and it was just like, come on, you know, like, All right. All I heard was outsource and China circa 2004 
Q started after Vegas. Uh, I don't think so. I think Q started before Vegas. I don't remember the exact day. Now look, I'm I'm a Pizzagate disinfo fad. I hope you're being sarcastic. But yeah, that's what people would say. Is is I'm a fad and all this other stuff. So it's like, all right. Well, if you think if you, you know if if you think that I'm a fad, then obviously you're wrong about some of the people who are feds <laughs> because I'm not a fed. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Deep State Devon Stack. That's me. Talk about de- decapitations, you fag. All right, well, you call me a fag, so guess what happens to you? Guess what happens to you? Well, maybe nothing if my touch screen doesn't work. <laughs> Where are you at, Epstein Island? You might have you might have slipped through the cracks this time because my stupid touch screen isn't working. All right. Well, you you've escaped this time, perhaps, unless you're still there when I reload, and then you're you're then you're fucked. Then you're fucked. All right, where are you at? There you are. And you are muted. Boom. What? And plus, what decapitations? No one even knows what you're talking about. Um, let's see here. Let me do a couple more, and then we'll. Uh, then I'm gonna bail out of here. Probably because my and my internet's not gonna last much longer anyway. Will the federal government become more like China, i.e., social credit? Yeah, that's the plan. I don't know if it will happen, but that that's the plan. Opinion on joining the military for Gibbs? Ah, uh, you know, if. Uh, I mean, if you realize what, if you if you realize what what's that, you know, if you understand that you're going to be fighting for Israel, and you might die for Israel, and you're okay with that that risk. I mean, you can learn a lot of skills, and you can get some good gibs, and maybe that's worth it to you. But it's kind of like just think of it this way: it's, in my opinion, morally or whatever, it's the same as like, well, I, I could join this mafia, and I'll make some money. And I'll get all these skills, and, uh, and then when I'm out, you know, I I'll, I can use those skills for good and that money for good. And you can look at it that way. It's the same, I think, morally. And it, you can even you can limit the risk, right? There's ways you can join the military where you're not the 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 meat shields on the front line. So I guess it depends on your your abilities. Okay. DOTR movie. Yeah, I've kind of dropped the ball on that a little bit. Let me let me say that I will I will hardcore revisit that in the next few weeks. That has been something in the back of my mind. Um, but I'll I'll do a whole stream. We'll we'll get that site set up finally and and uh and I'll address a lot of people have sent me stuff that I haven't responded to and I feel bad about that. Uh, but it needs to happen. And I've actually shot some footage for it. Um, but and this time it's not dropping frames. All right, I'm just going to wrap it up. The Internet's not behaving. This is about the time of morning it stops working. It usually doesn't totally disconnect like it's been doing today. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, okay. Let's go through and ban a couple more people here. (laughs) 
Like one guy said that I'm just a boomer on the radio. All right. Really? I'm just a boomer on the radio, huh? Well, your name is Canceled Tendies. Well, you know what, Canceled Tendies? You picked a good name. You picked a very appropriate name. Because I'm going to cancel your tendies. Oh, no. That was fair criticism. It was fair criticism, I tell you. Please. Please don't cancel me, sir. Don't cancel my tendies. Oh. Oh, tendies canceled. Oh, so sorry. So sorry. All right, guys. I'm going to go ahead and uh, bail out of here. And uh, you guys have a wonderful day. I'm probably going to have to ban many people later. But you might, you might escape the wrath just because I don't feel like looking at chat right now. Sorry for the dropouts. I think when you watch the replay, it puts it all together. Hopefully, it's not like a bunch of little stupid streams. Either way, even if it is, I will uh, stitch it together and put it on. Uh, put this one on bit, bit shoot. So, in the meantime, have a wonderful day. And as always, oh, and make sure you go watch the 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 diehard video on bit shoot as well. And for Black Pilled, I am of course Devin Stack. <laughs> Thank you.